We elect our politicians to act in the public good. They're not simply seeking the vote of the individual citizen at the ballot box. They're also seeking their trust. We would expect them to adhere to principles of honesty, transparency. But how do we know they are disclosing all their private interests? If a person has a particular interest, they have to disclose the fact of that interest. We went undercover to see how far some politicians were prepared to go. I mean, investment is a... Uh, Max 200,000 euros, right? Max 200,000. Yeah. yeah. I'm absolutely astonished to see behaviour like this disgust me. I cannot be seen to be involved with convinced opportunity directly. No, I know. I will be working, I'll be working for them yeah. tirelessly yeah. at the coal face within the council. Not there speaks all money, not there speaks all languages. In many ways, it's a very dark day for Irish politics. Together we have elected just under 1,200 politicians to make laws and decisions on our behalf. There are 949 councillors, 166 TDs, 60 senators and 11 MEPs. There are three key pillars in place to ensure our politicians adhere to ethical standards. First, at the start of each year, politicians must list all of their interests. Second, there are rules for what they must do if a potential conflict of interest arises while they are performing their role as an elected representative. The third and most important pillar is the law, making it very clear that they cannot seek any private benefit for their public work. Let's look at the first pillar. Every year, to ensure transparency, our elected representatives are asked to make a short, simple list of what they own and where else they might earn money. These statements are supposed to be the windows that people can look through to make sure that private interests do not influence public decisions. These are known as their annual ethics declarations. They are important documents. They are statutory obligations on the person. The statement form that an Oireachtas member has to sign and the declaration form that a local authority member has to sign is a relatively short form under eight or nine headings in terms of the different types of interest that they may hold and just setting out what the facts of those, those interests are. This key document, the Declaration of Interest, was the foundation for our investigation. But first we wanted to see how the system worked. Going back a number of years, we examined property deals involving public bodies, planning applications and zoning decisions. We checked tax defaulter lists, judgment orders and court reports. Then we researched all politicians in the country, regardless of party affiliation or position. We also cross-checked for different addresses, dates of birth and variations of names. We examined each of their declarations of interest. To collate this information, we built a database that could match their declarations against property titles and company registration records. Finally, we went about validating instances where our research indicated there appeared to be undeclared interests. Those who seek public office, to be frank, need to get it into their heads that if you seek public office, uh, you're serving the public and the public have a right to know what uh, interests uh, you hold as one who seeks uh, their vote. And when, re remember, when you seek someone's vote, you're seeking their trust. Our first set of results focused on company directorships. There are strict reporting requirements here. The size, profitability or trading status of the company does not matter. Even if the role is unpaid, it still has to be declared until the company is legally dissolved. In the Dáil, deputies Anya Collins, Noel Grealish and Tom Barry held directorships that had not been declared. Likewise for Senators Tom Sheehan and Marianne O'Brien. When we contacted them, they each promptly indicated they would correct the record. 
individually, they said, either administrative errors or a lack of understanding of the rules was the reason for the directorship not appearing. At local authority level, we contacted a significant number of councillors seeking clarification when our research suggested they had omitted details from their declarations. Among these were people with investments and directorships in development companies and auctioneering businesses, where there is a particular onus to declare connections. When we checked the declaration for first-time Mayo councillor Paul McNamara, we saw he correctly declared a company that earns four million a year in state contracts. But when we researched further, we discovered he did not declare a construction company. We separately found this firm had forked out almost 400,000 euro as a tax defaulter. Another development company. This business is in receivership. And two development sites he owned in 2014. These were put into NAMA and late last year, one was also the subject of a planning application to Mayo County Council. Councillor McNamara said he has now submitted an amended declaration to cover one of the properties and that the other site has since been sold. He said it was an oversight and he did not believe he had any conflict of interest. You can check the undeclared interest for many other councillors on the RTE Investigations Unit website. Since planning laws were first introduced in Ireland, there has been special attention paid to the involvement of politicians in any land the state could be concerned with. For that reason, land is particularly prominent in the declaration requirements. Obviously, public officials are entitled to their private lives and their private interests, but they also have a duty to the public to ensure that everything that they do um, as a public official is their decisions are taken for good public interest reasons and not influenced by their own private interests. It's obviously important that uh, an interest that they have within a particular area would be uh, disclosed uh, so that the potential for a conflict is known. To test this key area, we ran checks against property titles across the country. In the Oireachtas, there are a particular set of rules for TDs and Senators, and they do not have to declare property that has a low value or if it's in personal use. Minister of State Anne Phelan amended her 2014 statement after we contacted her about a second house she owns that was not on the register. She said she would amend all previous statements and rectify this oversight. There was a similar story at a council level, we received responses back from dozens of councillors who told us their omissions were an honest mistake, inadvertent, an oversight, an error, a discrepancy, an asset which I erroneously failed to include. Councillor Fergal Curtin and Cavan did not include three companies, an occupation, a home, a farm, and two rental properties, and said, I had honestly, if mistakenly, believed the above were not relevant for the purposes of my annual declaration. In the same electoral area, Val Smith's declaration did not include any land. However, when contacted by RTE, he said it was an error not to list a home, a farm, a rental property and a contract to purchase another house. So is there any room for politicians who sign forms to state that they understand the rules but subsequently say they didn't understand them at all? We believe that any public official must fully inform themselves of their obligations. A generous interpretation would be, yeah, that people simply forgot or didn't realise, uh, but I think it's incumbent and beholden to those who seek a public office uh, to realise and then to actually register what they own. A Rockless member and former junior minister John Perry owns this residentially zoned site and house in Ballymote, Sligo. When we first contacted him, he said he did not need to separately declare it because it is used as an overflow car park and storage building for the supermarket across the road, which is on his register of interests. 
This is despite him writing to Sligo County Council and it being a condition of planning permission in 2011 that the one thing he would not and could not use the property for was either a car park or a commercial storage facility. In a subsequent statement, Deputy Perry said, As far as I am concerned, this area was always considered by me as being part of the supermarket. And since the council's decision in 2011 not to allow parking on this portion of ground, the area has just been left derelict and unused. Declarations of interest are supposed to lead to transparency. If a politician does have a private interest that you might need to know about, it's there in black and white. But actually, the system is not that consistent. It contains different rules for different types of politician. We found a number of cases where Oireachtas members had an interest in additional property which the rules allowed them not to declare. At a local level, councillors have to declare every single property they have a personal interest in, regardless of the nature of their involvement or the value of the asset. Councillors have great powers to influence the value of land through zoning and planning decisions, and the ethics law reflects this. However, we found there was a clear failure to fully disclose property interests right across all local authorities. Just over 40% of councillors across all the mainstream political parties declared no property at all, not even the home they are living in, when they are required to do so. In Cork City, Kenneth O'Flynn declared no interest whatsoever, when in fact he owns three commercial properties and a rental apartment. In a statement he said he had corrected the record as he was not aware properties owned in family partnerships had to be included. Tune based councillor Tom McHugh has an unfinished house, a 30 acre farm along with portions of commercial and development land which he did not declare. This month he wrote to Galway County Council to apologise for his oversight and to set the record straight. In 2014, his company received €150,000 from Galway County Council for building services. He said this did not need to be declared as it was a grant to complete an unfinished housing estate, not a local authority contract. Councillors and anybody, I suppose, in local authorities are in a very powerful positions because they play a vital role in the land use in Ireland and also they have relatively large budgets. They also control a number of different um, public procurement contracts which can be very high in value and have great impact on the community. Some people might argue that, well, this is going too far, but in my view it's an essential component of the arsenal that the state has for itself in ensuring that its politics is clean and those who then seek public office uh, should have no uh, hesitation in declaring their interests and they also need to know about it. Local councillors have an enormous amount of power over our lives and especially over the land we live in. Our research suggested many councillors had failed to declare all of their assets. With that in mind, we decided to investigate further. After finding evidence of widespread failures to meet the declaration requirements, we narrowed the focus. We turn to the second pillar of the ethical framework, the rules governing what politicians should do if their private activities cross paths with the decisions they make as public representatives. Independent councillor Alan Coleman is a former Fianna Fáil mayor of Cork. When completing his declaration for 2014, he failed to list a second house he owns outside Charleville. He also listed a site in Gary Lucas on the old head of Kinsale as farming. We researched this further. Councillor Coleman owns the Gary Lucas property with development partners and it sits in the Bandon local area. In 2011, part of this land was granted planning permission for 12 houses. Councillors do not have a role in planning applications, but they do have a role in deciding local development plans. In the case of Councillor Coleman's site, it was subject to the Bandon Local Area Plan and that was up for renewal later in 2011. The new plan maintained the site's favourable residential status. 
another measure brought greater flexibility to how existing planning permissions would count towards specific construction targets in towns and villages across County Cork, including Gary Lucas. That amendment indicated that housing numbers did not have to be rigid. How was this relevant to Councillor Coleman? Because he and his partners had just got planning permission in 2011 and owned a considerable portion of the undeveloped land in Gary Lucas. These proposals went before councillors on July 19, 2011. The finalised plan was put before councillors a week later. Councillor Coleman took part in the meeting and voted in favour of the measures without declaring his interest. The law is clear. Councillors cannot take part in any meeting where something that might affect them or those close to them is up for decision. Firstly, they must declare their interest. They must disclose the interests that they have. Then they must withdraw from the meeting. In correspondence, solicitors for Mr Coleman said he had not declared the house in Charleville as it had fallen substantially in value and this is not the type of land that was intended to be covered by the declaration. In relation to the Gary Lucas site, the solicitors said it remained undeveloped farmland and even a cursory comparison of the 2006 development plan and the current development plan makes it clear that there have been no changes that could feasibly benefit the property. Our investigation looked in detail at ethics registers across the country to find evidence of potential and actual conflicts of interest. In the process, we also found many politicians at all levels who had diligently and fully adhered to their legal requirements. But as a result of our findings, a significant number of other public representatives have now admitted to errors, mistakes and omissions in their annual statements of interest. The law is even stricter on those who mislead the public deliberately. In framing the 2001 Local Government Act, the legislature also took the matter of declarations very seriously because it is an offence to give a false or misleading declaration in just the same way as it's an offence to fail to give a declaration. There's a proposal at the moment to reform the ethics legislation. It's quite complex. It is difficult. Uh, and experts in the area have acknowledged this. Part one of our investigation has shown examples of many politicians who fail to adhere to the strict declaration requirements laid down in the law. But the final pillar of the ethics rules govern the even more serious offences of seeking or receiving personal benefits for public work. In part two, we reveal how, based on our extensive research, we went undercover to find out how far some councillors would actually go. Yeah. What I can be is a, a link man or a gopher or whatever, but in ear planner, ear architects and mm -hmm. the local authority. Mm -hmm. um, for me, you see, I need to be very careful because I don't talk with phone because you could have been. I know. You would have been a, a reporter. Okay. And anything we do from here on in yeah. is utterly confidential. Yes. Naturally. Yeah. yeah. Because if you let me down. There'll be war. In part one, we profiled every elected representative in the country to establish what was not being declared. Then we went to find politicians who would be willing to work for a fictional investment company while not declaring that interest. We decided to mimic one of the countless nondescript investment companies claiming to have money to back opportunities in Ireland. We put together a fake company, Vinced Opportunities, whose imaginary investors had supposedly spotted potential in Irish wind farms. The representative of Vinced Opportunities was in fact a journalist who cold called the councillors. Hello, my name is Nina. I work for a company called Wins. Yes, Council. My name is Nina. Our Council. investors are considering Bring investing in a number of wind farm opportunities in Ireland. I was wondering if you had a few minutes to talk. Do you, do you to think us that's that something you can assist us with? Our pitch to councillors was that we wanted to eliminate the risks of not getting planning permission. There's nothing wrong with councillors helping potential developers once they obey the law. 
our first request was to ask councillors if they were willing to work with us to solve planning problems on a strictly confidential basis. A select number of councillors were contacted. Two refused to meet, saying that such confidential lobbying was inappropriate or illegal. Meetings could not be arranged with others. And last month, a handful of local authority members agreed to meet under confidential terms to discuss getting around planning problems. It's hard to find an aspect of public life in Sligo that Councillor Joe Queenan is not involved in. The Fianna Fáil stalwart is both a former chairman of the GEA County Board and of Sligo's Institute of Technology. He is a councillor for 18 years and has held the mayoral chains during its most significant event in recent memory, greeting Prince Charles on behalf of the people of Sligo. I welcome you wholeheartedly to Sligo and to invite you to explore and sample all that it has to offer. When he offered his services to us, he focused on the value of the pre-planning process, which is where the prospects of a potential development are discussed with local planners. This is an important stage of any development, and Section 247 of the Planning Act makes it very clear that it's a criminal offence for councillors to seek any favour, benefit or payment, direct or indirect, for the work they might do in this area. Councillors will sometimes accompany the person who owns the land. They may set up the meeting with the officials, which would be quite in order in their representative role, representing their constituents. Either councillors or officials who attend a Section 247 meeting commit an offence if they seek or accept any favour or um, benefit or payment in respect of the meeting carried out. This offence has been considered very serious by the legislature. When we initially approached Councillor Queenan, we stressed the need for confidentiality. Then when we met him, he laid out what he would do for our mystery group of investors. Yeah. What I can be is a, a link man or a gopher or whatever between your planner, your architects and the mm -hmm. local authority. Mm -hmm. And I can be the eyes and ears and I will know, they will tell me a good working relationship with them. And if there's, if, there's, if there's amendments be done or any, mm -hmm. well, I go in and talk to parents, encourage them and impress on them the part of the time. Mm -hmm. The lobbying happens all across the, uh, the world uh, in, a political, in all political uh, systems, but it needs to be done openly. What, so what needs to happen is people watching this programme tonight need to know who is lobbying who and about what. And what we have here in this particular example is what we might call secret or covert lobbying. Uh, that does nobody any good. Uh, lobbying must be open, it must be transparent, and ultimately public representatives must be accountable. Councillor Queenan stressed that while he was happy to work for our fake company, he wanted to make sure nobody would find out. I'm not looking for anything else. But it, okay. All I want is, is that we keep confidential. And confidential, we'll yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. I'll do me a little bit of um, uh, lobbying behind the scenes with the local authority for you. Okay. Providing it's realistic. If I see it, Dave, when you come in with something that isn't realistic, I'll tell you straight away, doesn't it? We'll waste our time going here, right? Okay. I'll be honest. I'll be very honest. Councillor Queenan then goes on to specifically deal with the pre planning process. What, what would, we, would we get from you? You get a commitment okay. when your expertise, when your when your yeah. when your engineers come to me, yeah. and give my contact number to them, mm -hmm. uh, come to me and uh, and bring the maps to me. Are they proposal to me? I will go to the council. Okay. And I, I will I will get first hand information okay. from the council. And I get a bottom line. I know from day, day one, uh, straight away whether it's a runner or not a runner, and then I'll report that back to you. Yeah. Right? Okay. What would you need from us? Uh, I'm not really. At the moment, I'm not, I'm not here for, for no. if you're asking for money or that. I'm not. Okay. I'm, not I'm not really. I, I wouldn't go down. I couldn't. If okay. I was caught, if I was actually seen doing that, yeah. I'd be I understand. out in the years that way, right? Yeah, I understand. But maybe down the road, I say I'm in business myself, mm -hmm. and I have some business projects coming up. You, you might be in, some of your, your clients might be in, in, investing with, with me in a, in a project. Maybe something like that. I'm just talking top of my head now, right? 
councillor Queenan was keen to assure our undercover reporter that everything could be kept secret. The last thing I want to do is polish to go public and say that I was being backed by tycoons from from the UK or from no. <laughs> for lobbying. That, that's illegal what I'll be doing. It'd be, so it'd be, yeah. it'd be a very grey area. I don't yeah. want to go there. Well, in my view, Councillor Queenan's approach in this whole uh, case uh, is uh, in breach of the, the code of conduct uh, for councillors uh, because he clearly states while he is looking for nothing at the moment and while he is not seeking any payment, uh, he does go on and talk about how uh, if it ever got out that he was potentially backed by a British uh, a tycoon, uh, that this, this would clearly be... Uh, uh, be, be wrong and uh, the potential talk about any business dealings into the future is in my view clearly in breach uh, of the code of conduct. We had not picked Councillor Queen and out at random. In February he signed the same declaration as all the other councillors to say he understood the law and the code of conduct he was bound to. And over the course of the next five pages he left every section of his declaration blank. There was no mention of his farm and his businesses. This is even though he had applied for planning permission for a commercial storage facility just two days before submitting his declaration. He also did not declare an auctioneering practice, yet that was acting as an agent for 24 landlords leasing properties to Sligo County Council. And if he was to help our fictitious company to identify wind farms, it was in his undeclared business interest where he spotted a potential return. And I'm, I'm still starting um, an agri feed business mm -hmm. in Innisfil, right? Where I know there's a market for. But mm -hmm. one of the issues at the moment is that I have enough of space. Mm -hmm. This is me personal now. Mm -hmm. I have enough of space. Councillor Queen and then described a particular property in Ennis Grown which he wanted to buy. As I got that for him, I said, "No, it cost me." The guy that owns it is looking for three hundred thousand. So, okay. It'll take, it'll, it'll take me another hundred thousand. It'll take four hundred thousand to get, get up and going. Let's see, this is my. I'm just telling you now. Is that I'm not looking for anything at the moment. So, I might be able to put half that money. At this moment, I might can secure half the money. So, I, I was thinking of getting some investors. Maybe it might be at all. Maybe come in and take a share of that business with me. Yeah. If, it, if it's viable, that's what I'm talking about. So, you're looking for investors for your yeah, yeah. companies? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I may be looking. Yeah. Yeah. It's a subtler approach, some would say, than looking for lots of money, you know, and being, you know, nakedly greedy about it. But it's equally, it's equally inappropriate. I have all the figures in off idea, but I mean, investment will say of psh, max two hundred thousand euros, right? Max two hundred thousand. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I repay it over a number of years. Mm -hmm. That's not that, that's that way you go at me. If it ever comes to that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm of the opinion that Councillor Queenan has uh, acted inappropriately uh, in this matter. Uh, so while he does make the point that clearly he seeks no interest, uh, he has no interest and he's, his main aim is, is, is jobs uh, for Sligo, uh, the conversation does clearly go on to talk about potential loans into the future. Whether these loans are paid back or not uh, is not the point. What is the point is that clearly this is in breach uh, of the code. The code says that councillors cannot seek uh, any pecuniary or other benefit at all. Councillor Queenan had mentioned during the meeting that he thought up his business proposal off the top of his head. In case he had a change of heart, we called him back that evening and asked him how he wanted to structure the support for his business and how he planned to keep it a secret. Also, right? And all these conversations, I mean, they're, I presume, are totally confidential. 
strict, I don't, strictly I don't, confidential. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to read them in a fucking in a local media paper and that's uh, the, the things that were the place of course. The language uh, he clearly used where he says he cannot uh, afford for this to, to come out into the open. And in my view, that is not how Irish politics should work. Irish politics should be open and transparent, and here it's covert and secret. In a statement, Councillor Queenan said, I unfortunately neglected to complete my annual written declaration as comprehensively as I should have and as comprehensively as I would have in previous years. I wholeheartedly regret this oversight. I take my role as an elected representative very seriously and am most conscious of the requirement to maintain standards of transparency in all my business interests. In relation to the footage taken at the meeting, solicitors for Councillor Queenan said their client was not corrupt and that he had repeatedly said he did not want a fee. After we contacted Councillor Queenan in relation to the issues raised in our investigation, he submitted an amended declaration to Sligo County Council to reflect all of his business interests and his properties. Our next meeting took place in Letterkenny with a man who first ran for election in 2014 in a county that already has one of the largest concentrations of wind farms on the island. Hi, John O'Donnell here. I'm running as an independent candidate in the local elections on May 23rd. I want you to vote for me because you need someone who will work harder and smarter for you. And remember, if you don't vote for change, how can you complain when things stay the same? At 34 years of age, Councillor O'Donnell has had businesses north and south of the border. His company has been involved in state construction projects and developing nursing homes. He was an immediate hit in politics and comfortably won his first election last year. Councillor O'Donnell had no hesitation in meeting our fake company and asked nothing about its background or its overall intentions. Within two days, he was in front of our undercover reporter, setting out his stall. I'm a developer myself. Yeah. Like, I'm a businessman. Mm -hmm. I'm, business not a, I'm not a negative person. I like to see things going forward, progress. Like, and uh, there's some members of Donegal County Council who would be completely opposite. I'm not to the left or I'm not too far to the right. If I feel that there's something that should go ahead mm -hmm. and it makes sense, I would be all for it, and if I think there's something that shouldn't go ahead, I'd be against it. Councillor O'Donnell also set out what he would do for us at the crucial pre-planning stage. We need, we need help. We need local. We need, yeah. Because need for some. these applications as well, for somebody like myself that's working within the council, yeah. like you're, you, you have a massive advantage because you know the planners, you know mm -hmm. the process, you're able to do what they call a pre-planning. Yeah. In listing off his record, he chose not to mention that on five occasions in the last four years, his companies have appeared on the tax defaulters list for under-declaring income and getting caught using unmarked diesel. Once again, our undercover reporter posed as a foreign investor seeking to invest in wind farm developments in the county. For me now today, I wanted to meet you first of all, mm -hmm. to just put a face to the name, get yeah. your details, yeah. and what I can do then is I can go quietly because we'll need to work very quietly on this. Uh, that's exactly what we want. We, we, we want, you know, strict, yeah. strictly confidentiality, you know. It's yeah, it has to be, because not only that, for me as a public representative, I need yeah. also, because, like, I don't want, uh, like, the, I suppose, like, for me, I'm, I'm all for one farm development. Mm -hmm. I believe that one farm development is good for the country, it's good for the county, it's a way mm -hmm. to the future. You know. well, what I can do now is I'll go today <laughs> and... I'll try and source, I'll source for you either a development that's work in progress at the mm -hmm. moment or I'll, I'll source for you a landowner with suitable ground for a development. Maybe that's what we could do yeah. moving on after today. One of the greatest areas of responsibility for councillors is the role they play in making the zoning decisions which end up in the county development plan. In this area, Councillor O'Donnell was particularly confident about his abilities. Do you think you can help us with the zoning issue? 
the 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 one that is that might be changing next year. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm in the I'm in the I'm in the yeah. control. Like. Yeah. Going over Europe. How would you do it? Like. Uh, how would I do it? I need to um, uh, lobby the other councillors yeah. to be more supportive of one farm development. Mm -hmm. That's you, how you do it. You've done it before. I've done it before on mm -hmm. other stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, of course, of course. And uh, to be fair, um, within the council, I would have, um, you know, I would have probably, there's 37 there. I would certainly have 25 to 30 that are always nearly with me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The one farm development plan that exists at the moment mm -hmm. and then in 2016, when we go to readdress it, um, I wouldn't be too concerned about it, really. What we would need to do at the moment, I think, is, is if there's a particular site or sites that we're looking at, that's where we want to be trying to mm -hmm. make sure and protect. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, not just the, the whole county development plan as a whole, because there might be other areas that are not on the plan mm -hmm. that we could find that there could be a very good, suitable site okay. that we could maybe acquire at small money. Yeah. And if you could ever acquire a site like that and then get the county development plan to cover that area, mm. that's where you're making money. Okay. Do you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, I know what you're saying. Well, the, the planning legislation has always been particularly strong in trying to um, prevent corrupt behaviour in planning because planning activity and zoning can confer, as we know, massive economic uh, benefits on people. He then explained exactly how he wanted to be paid for the work he would do on behalf of our fictional company. I require nothing for to get, for to do a small uh, section of work yeah. to show you that there's going to be something in the back of it, and then we can sit down and myself okay. and yourself, and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll sit down. And as well, would do a lot of projects with me okay. because he would bring a lot of stuff to the table for me. Mm -hmm. And would, you know, do people pay him then? Like, would we pay him for doing the work for us? Like, yeah, yeah, you'd be paying him. Yeah. See, I don't want to be seen to be. No, okay. But you get paid through him. I'll get paid through him. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, uh, yeah, it, it does, yeah. So, <laughs> must be involved. Yeah. In, in, and for, we... for my protection, yeah. he has to be involved. Exactly. I if that makes that. sense, Nina, because Perfectly. for me, I cannot be seen to be involved with convinced opportunity directly. No, I know. I will be working, I'll be working for them yeah. tirelessly yeah. at the coal face within the council. Okay. But I'll have no connection with them. So okay. It'll be through, it'll be through We'll have somebody doing the consultancy work. Okay, there. great. Yeah, I understand perfectly. Because for me, there's really a backlash. You know what people are. I know. Yeah. So many begrudgers out there. It's not even. Funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think the the little sly wink told us a lot uh, in in that case. Maybe full of the confidence of youth, but youth is no guarantee of virtue uh, either. In my view, there is no grey area at all in relation to uh, Councillor O'Donnell's uh, uh, behaviour in this particular uh, clip. Uh, the phrase, I get paid through him, is in my view, again, a clear breach of the code of conduct uh, for councillors because it talks of private enrichment uh, through public office. And in that context, there clearly is, uh, is uh, an overt uh, breach and again uh, Councillor O'Donnell is damned by his own words where he talks you know at some length about uh, how all this should be done in, in secret and that he cannot afford uh, for it to come out and again this is in my view uh, the way Irish politics should not work this is not how citizens of this state should expect their public representatives uh, to behave. What is deeply damning and I think deeply distressing uh, and will be for viewers of this programme is individuals seeking private gain out of a potential public good. In written correspondence to RTE, Councillor O'Donnell said all tax issues related to his companies and not to him personally. He said he believed the company might be investing in the Donegal economy and that his reference to a payment was made on the basis that I, as a businessman, might be participating in any project that materialised from work I would be completing as a businessman. 
and any payments for such work would be dealt with by the professional team I would be putting together and strictly in accordance with the law and the applicable ethical disclosure procedures. He also said, RTE now proposes to reveal my business secrets, style and methods in a programme which could enable other entrepreneurs to copy them and thereby cause me, as a businessman, very serious damage. In Sligo, we had a request to fund a private and undeclared business venture. In Donegal, we were directed towards a classic middleman to do the deal. But when we got to Monaghan, we met someone who preferred a far more straightforward method, cash in a bag. It is no exaggeration to say Councillor Hugh McIlvanny is one of the most senior politicians at local authority level in Ireland. The local councillor is the bread and butter of public representation in my book. Last year, he won a seat on Monaghan County Council for a ninth successive time, leading a ticket that delivered three seats for Fine Gael and the Clonus area. He has been mayor of Monaghan four times and was chairman of the local authority members association from 2009 to 2014. This put him at the helm of a representative body for councillors that each year rewards best practice in the sector. He still sits on its board. Away from politics, Councillor McIlvanny has a significant shareholding in a waste disposal business. He and his partners collect rubbish on behalf of a number of local authorities across the country, together turning over more than 16 million euro a year. This year, he signed his declaration of interest on February 12th. He swiped a line across the section where he was supposed to declare his property interests. Instead of listing that he owned a substantial farm in Cavanagarvan, houses and a commercial property. If those properties were not on his mind on February 12th, they were a day earlier when he submitted two separate planning applications to Monaghan County Council to develop a house on one location and a storage facility in another. Along with his undeclared properties, Councillor McIlvanny was also a director of a consultancy company, which he never mentioned. So six weeks ago, he got a call from our fictitious wind energy investment company interested in a county where there is currently only one active wind farm. The following all took place during the course of our initial five-minute phone call. I have a question for you, Mina. Okay. I have a question for you. All right. What's in it for me? Well, we believe that you could be uniquely placed to help us predict what might happen in the council and what might happen in the communities. Correct. And yes. when... when... I, I can help. We, uh, what are you putting on the table for me? Well, all of these investors are uh, are wanting to come to Ireland. What is up on the dodgy? Well, we need you to help us evaluate yes. sites and choose between them. That's what we need. Yes. And yes. we are you going to pay me, baby, or or pay the job? Yes, we want you to work with us on that. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. I'm going to ask you a question. Whatever you want, McElwain. Are you going to pay me by the hour or by the job? Yes, with information you offer, you would get paid for it. Right, okay. Okay, but no. this is strictly private and our investors want, want to remain oh, yes. private I and, and confidential. Private as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So when are you coming to Ireland? I am coming to Ireland in two weeks and... I will uh, meet you. Yes, you will meet me. Great. Yeah, and then I can yeah. give you, you all you, the details and all the information we have. And you have plenty of sterling with you. You need to sweeten the man up, do you know what I mean? Yeah. If, if, no, you need if, to sweeten if, them up. I hear you're ready to work with us on this, so I'm very glad. You know, this is exactly the information we need. Sure, but you need to put sterling on the table, Nina. How much do you want? How much do you need? Well, ten grand would be a start. Ten grand? Yeah, Great. Right. That'd be a start. Yeah, it's a good figure. Yeah, it's um, a nice little figure, isn't it? Sorry? Sorry? It's a nice little figure. The line, what's in it for me, is, in my view, the... In one way, the greatest disappointment I've seen in 20 years as a, an academic uh, and a scholar of Irish politics and one who studies uh, lobbying and uh, regulation uh, 
I just found it deeply shocking, deeply uh, upsetting, uh, because it's the antithesis of the public interest. Following his request for £10,000 sterling in cash and without asking for any details on the company or the specifics of its intentions, Councillor McIlvanny agreed to meet. He did not put many conditions on the potential business arrangement once we were clear that nobody could find out. Well, this meeting is, is confidential. Absolutely. And anything we do from here on in yeah. is utterly confidential. Yes. Naturally. Yeah. yeah, because if you let me do there'll be war. <laughs> yeah. And our reporter asked him, as a councillor, what could he do for us? Okay. It's money. And that's where your interest is. Mm -hmm. So we go out there. Then I'll do a little bit of homework for you, your people, in relation to this. Okay? Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Because I know a lot of people. The land will be purchased on condition that you get permission to build. Yes. Yeah. On condition. Yeah. So then we go to the council for permission and then I operate there for you as well. Yeah. Huh. So I'm the conduit between your investment company and the county council. And I'm also the conduit between you and the people where you intend building. He also described the role he would play during the pre-planning process. So what you have to do, Nina, sorry, I don't mean to find what you have to do or your company needs to do is to identify sites for your wind farms. Yeah. Prioritize them. Mm -hmm. Then when you get a good area that you think you could build, you then speak to me in relation to that particular area, in relation to the people that live in it, in relation to the compensation that you may be offering them, mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing. That's where you start. Yes, I know. That, that will be all taken care of. We are, just, we are just evaluating, you know, the planning process. We want to make sure we get the planning permission before we go any further. Yeah, okay. You know what I mean? That's what you call pre-planning. Pre-planning. Yeah. yeah. But you can't go in with a blank sheet to the planners. You have no. to have a venue. Councillor McIlvanny was then asked what he would require to do this work for us. In money terms? Yeah, whatever. Uh, well, it'll be, it'll be money. Yeah. Sterling. Sterling. But not until we see how we, uh, how we um, approach it and how we succeed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Don't want money otherwise. If it's not successful for you, I'm out of the equation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But if it is successful for you, mm. I want loads of money. Yeah. Ah. He made absolutely clear that what he wanted was money and lots of money. Well, my initial reaction was that I was gobsmacked. I don't know how much stronger I can, I can put it, really. Um, yes, it was, it was blatant. It was naked promotion of someone's self-interest at the expense of the public interest, and it's wrong. Councillor McIlvanny wrapped up the meeting, making it clear to our reporter the terms of engagement and what the next steps would be. How, how much do you want? How much would you like? Oh, I don't know, Nina. No. I mentioned 10,000 to you on the phone. I was yeah, only fooling. I was only fooling. OK. Yeah. I don't know yet. I, look, somebody else will decide that for us. OK. OK. Until we have the idea of, like, what we could get, you know, and yeah. what we can achieve yes. in the coming weeks. Yes. You know, we, we'll decide the figure. We'll see how we get on. We'll not do any figures yet. Okay. No. Okay. No. But, you know, you, you know how things work here, yes. obviously. You know what of to course. do. Of course. So... But I'm not going to take anybody over a bar, nor do I want to be pulled over a bar either. I'd like a nice relationship in relation to all of this. After he received a letter from RTE, Councillor McIlvanny sent correspondence to say he would respond to the issues raised. As yet, he has not done so. 
Six days after the RT Investigations Unit handed Councillor McIlvany a letter outlining the issues raised in our investigation, he attracted national attention for the principal stand he took at a public meeting in Monaghan. After 40 years, he resigned from Fine Gael. He said he was protesting at the development of the North-South Grid Connector, which ironically would have been a key piece of infrastructure if the likes of our fictional wind turbine investment company was to export electricity to the UK. I have given my life to the people of County Monaghan and to my party, fitting the end. So it is with deep, deep grief that I announce my resignation from Finnegan Gale here tonight. I am resigning because my conscience tells me it is right to do so. I do this because I believe the political system is broken and the people at the heart of this broken system are simply serving themselves. <laughs> We can all see the politics of microphones and megaphones. But it's perhaps away from the soundbite of public meetings and the noise of the campaign trail that the true value of transparency laws emerge. They exist so that we can also know the agendas of those we elect when they engage in secret meetings and in private phone calls. Let me talk to our investors and I'll meet you in Ireland uh, the beginning of November. Do you have a specific day you might meet us? No, no, no. I'm not going to tell you because I live here and I'm quite flexible. You're quite flexible. Great. Um, shouldn't I just yeah. call you up? I'm in the bag, the cleaner I will be. I'll call you next week and we set a date then, yeah? Thank you, Peter, yeah. Great, great, no. councillor. Very good speaking to you. I'll, I'll be in touch. Don't tell anybody else our terms and conditions. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, councillor. Bye. Bye.